This is Dr. K with I Medical School, and here's sepsis in five minutes. Let's start our discussion off with understanding what is sepsis. It is an inflammatory dysregulation due to rampant infection. Over 50% of cases are caused by gram-positive organisms. Though, many other organisms, including gram-negative organisms, can cause sepsis. Now, let's take a look at the pathology of sepsis. Keep in mind that sepsis can be caused by multiple etiologies. Sepsis usually begins with cellular injury from an infection or toxin that triggers a profound inflammatory response. Inflammatory mediators involved in this response include TNF, IL-1, and other cytokines and chemokines. Damage to the endothelium triggers the coagulation cascade, causing microclots of fibrin, neutrophils, platelets, and RBCs. The development of microclots can lead to poor nutrition, oxygen delivery, and poor perfusion to vital organs because of blockages in the vessels. Let's look at symptoms and signs of sepsis. The cardinal signs of sepsis include fever, hypotension, and tachycardia. Other symptoms and signs include acute kidney injury, cold extremities, altered mental status, vomiting, fatigue, shortness of breath, septic emboli, and nausea. Always keep in mind that though there are many subjective symptoms of sepsis, fever, hypotension, and tachycardia are your cardinal signs. Now let's look at the diagnosis of sepsis. Like with any diagnosis, sepsis has specific criteria that must be met to qualify a patient with the diagnosis of sepsis. First, the patient must have a known or suspected infection with at least two of the following SERS criteria. Temperature greater than 38 degrees Celsius or less than 36 degrees Celsius, respiratory rate greater than 20, white count greater than 12,000 or less than 4,000, heart rate greater than 90 beats per minute. Severe sepsis is classified when there's evidence of sepsis-induced organ dysfunction, such as acute kidney injury, hypoxemia, or a low platelet count. When a patient develops shock or hypotension during sepsis, this is called septic shock. Once you have made the diagnosis of sepsis, it is important to understand the treatment of sepsis. Like with any critical patient, we need to start off with our ABCDs, airway, breathing, circulation, and disability. Food resuscitation is one of the most important aspects of sepsis treatment. Four to six liters of fluid should be given within the first six hours. If the patient is not responsive to fluid, vasopressors can be started. At this time, you should think about central access and the placement of an arterial line to monitor blood pressures. The Surviving Sepsis Campaign provided goals for both fluid resuscitation and sepsis management. A urine output greater than or equal to 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour, a central venous pressure from 8 to 12 millimeters mercury, a mean arterial pressure greater than or equal to 65. Once fluid resuscitation has occurred and the patient is stabilized, the next step is to identify the source of the sepsis and treat that source. You can identify the source of the sepsis by A, obtaining blood cultures, B, undergoing imaging. Always consider other etiologies for septic shock. For example, cardiogenic shock can lead to hypotension and appear just like a sepsis picture. Included in the treatment of sepsis is broad spectrum antibiotics. One possible combination of antibiotics would be vancomycin, zosin, and azithromycin as broad spectrum coverage. Now let's talk about corticosteroids. It is important to understand when steroids should be used. Do not give steroids if both vasopressors and fluids are able to achieve a systolic blood pressure of at least 90 because the corticus study has shown no improvement in morbidity and mortality. The next important drug is activated protein C, otherwise known as Zygris. Activated protein C stabilizes endothelial injury inhibits thrombin formation by blocking 5A and 8A factors, preventing microclots from forming. 
It also reduces the release of inflammatory mediators. Zygris should only be used in patients with severe sepsis that have greater than one organ dysfunction. Studies have shown that patients who have severe sepsis with only one organ dysfunction actually have increased morbidity with the use of Zygris. Next, let's take a look at how mechanical ventilation plays a role in sepsis. For patients with ARDS, a tidal volume of 6 milliliters per kilogram of predicted body weight should be used. The use of PEEP will help prevent lung collapse and thus lung injury in mechanically ventilated patients with sepsis. Having a transfusion strategy is important in sepsis. The transfusion goal for any patient should be greater than 7 for the hemoglobin unless they're an elderly patient with a history of MI and then you can consider a hemoglobin of 8. Studies have shown that transfusing to a hemoglobin of 10 has shown no benefit to patients. Next, let's talk about glucose control, which is important in sepsis as patients will be hyperglycemic. The NICE sugar study showed that glucose goals of 180 are best for patients with sepsis as this decreases mortality. Stricter control actually leads to higher mortality rates. This was a five minute review of sepsis. If you like this video, give it a like, comment, subscribe. This is Dr. K from iMedical School. I'll see you next time.